There used to be a bar called Georgie's, across the street from my office, which had been closed and apparently just left to rot well before I started working here. And as such, I had never seen the inside of it. All that I knew about it was what I could gather walking past the front windows every morning as I got off the bus. There were signs and flyers taped to the window, much like any bar. Coors Crafts were 50 cents on Tuesdays. Wednesday was ladies' night, and they required ID from all the patrons. Behind the hastily taped up signs, the windows were all covered in aging brown butcher paper, like many similar boarded-up establishments. So the signs truly were the depth of my knowledge. I work really late hours pretty regularly. My company analyzes data for large institutions, and most of our clients require guarantees and agreements in place to turn around any work we receive in 48 hours or less. My part of this is the last step in a rather complicated and admittedly boring process, and as such, my schedule is generally the most affected by any kinks in the system. As a result of my messed up work schedule, I found myself running into the building custodian doing his nightly rounds with a certain bit of regularity. He'd come in sometime around 7 to 8 p.m. every night, mutter to himself, pull the bags out of all the trash baskets around me, tie them off, leave them in the hall by the doors, and go about his routine. Looking at him, it was pretty obvious that he had a few years under his belt, as nobody's ever accused anybody who spent their days mired in hard labor and poor health decisions of having a deceptively youthful appearance, if you know what I'm saying. After a few nights of having him and I be the only two in the building, he finished off his routine by telling me that I should stop in at Georgie's some night. Georgie's, the abandoned bar across the street. Now, I don't want to come off as a jerk or anything, but my first thought was that the custodian was retarded in some variety, and that he didn't really know what he was talking about. With little faith in the custodian's mental abilities, I sort of half-heartedly told him that I was reasonably certain that the bar in question had been closed for a while, and that I had never seen it open since I started working in that building years prior. The custodian seemed a bit put off by this, and told me that one of his friends owned the building and that he had been trying to clean it out at night by inviting people to come drink the leftover booze for free. I have to admit that I was sort of put off by the idea of drinking years-old liquor in a presumably dilapidated and abandoned bar, so I politely brushed off the idea. Besides, I sensed that there was just something off about a story like that, something that just didn't add up about an owner of an abandoned bar cleaning up his property by giving away liquor of questionable origin instead of throwing it away. But once again, I assume that there might also just be something off about the custodian himself, in the form of a mental disability. So I ignored it and moved on. I went back to work and didn't think any more of it. It was about the same time that I noticed a man who would get up on the bus at my stop when I went home, roughly every night. At first, I hardly paid attention to him, because seeing regular people at a bus stop isn't exactly out of the ordinary. After a week of seeing him, though, it occurred to me that it was a bit odd to see the same person at my bus stop with any frequency, given the fact that my schedule follows no pattern. I might leave at 7 p.m. today and 12.30 a.m. tomorrow, and something completely different next week. I stewed on this for a bit, but decided not to dwell on it too much. Since, as my father always told me, you only notice coincidences because they are oddly coincidental. This series of coincidences did bring my attention to this man, though, and I couldn't help but notice that he was old and more than a bit harsh-looking. 
His eyes were sunken in, and his skin had the kind of pallor that generally accompanies people you don't want to associate with. There was just something inexplicably unsettling about him. But he was quiet and kept to himself, so I just let it pass. The custodian began asking me almost nightly about stopping in for a drink at Georgie's, and I politely shrugged him off every time. My personal desire for aging liquor had sadly not grown since the last time he asked me. His insistence grew firmer every day, but there was a slight hesitation in his responses to my refusal, as if he was straining himself to keep his tone and demeanor reasonable. One morning I woke up at my apartment and headed out to catch the bus, and found the decrepit old man who I usually see in the evenings sitting at the corner of my street, not a hundred feet away from my apartment building, waiting to catch the same bus as me going into town. While this did admittedly creep me out a little, I tried to rationalize it to myself with my usual mantra about coincidences and all of that. The bus eventually came, and we both got on without saying a word. I lost myself in thought, as I usually do on buses, thinking about my schedule for the day, clients who needed to be handled, women I wanted to know better, and all of the other mindless shit I wander off to while waiting for the bus to get into town. Today, however, my pleasant daydream cloud was hastily burst when I absentmindedly caught a glance of the old man's reflection in the bus window. He was gawking at me from behind, head slightly crooked forward, eyes dead front, teeth just visible through a barely parted scowl, staring at me. I was a bit unnerved by this, but didn't want to make a scene. Nor did I really know what I would do if I wanted to make a scene. He hadn't actually done anything other than sit on the bus, and for all I know, he was also just lost in thought. Perhaps he was just staring off into space, and I just happened to be in the path between his eyes and the nothing he was staring off into. I wasn't about to make any assumptions. Eventually we made it into town, and we both got off the bus, continuing our habit of not saying a word to each other. I went through the rest of my day as if everything was normal. I left the office at 9.20 p.m., and the old man was waiting at the bus stop. Neither one of us spoke to each other as usual, and eventually the bus came to pick the two of us up. As the bus was coming, I made the realization that every time we had gotten onto the bus together, we'd always lined up in such a manner that I'd get on before him. I had not consciously been arranging for this to happen, and while briefly considering it, I was certain that this happened whether it was just us or if it was a group of people waiting. The bus came to a stop and opened the doors. I immediately recognized that the old man was intentionally moving slower than I was so that he would end up on the bus after I did. I generally always sat toward the front, so my best guess is that he was trying to position himself to sit behind me to watch me. As I approached the doors to the bus, I quickly fumbled my wallet out of my pocket and intentionally dropped it under the front tire closest to me. I feigned an apology to the driver and said I would be just one minute if she could be so patient. The old man first tried to assist, presumably so he could maintain his ruse, but I sternly told him that I was capable of handling this by myself. This prompted the bus driver, thankfully, to ask the old man if he was getting on or not, to which he relented and boarded. I picked up my wallet and stepped onto the bus. I apologized once again to the driver and walked towards the seats. The old man had taken the very front seat, and so I went a few rows back on the opposite side. I looked in the mirror at the front of the bus and saw it. He was staring at me in the mirror. I met his eyes 
dead on, and we stared at each other for a good five minutes as the bus began driving. I began sweating profusely as I realized that my suspicions of the old man were most likely in the ballpark of truth, and that none of the coincidences that I had noticed lately were actually coincidences. After about ten minutes, he finally broke his gaze and turned around. He looked me straight on, and in an angry tone asked me a question. Why don't you ever go to Georgie's? Spooked, I shrugged my shoulders. I had no idea how else to react to this. We were still inside city limits, so I yelled to the bus driver to let me off at the next stop. She obliged and I stood up to get off. My mind set on catching a taxi to any random hotel far away from my house or office. I didn't want to see anybody familiar that night or the next morning. I wanted the coincidences to give me a break. As I walked past the old man to get off the bus, he hissed at me. You would have liked it. I stayed quiet and hurried off the bus. The old man stayed on the bus as it started moving again, finally granting me peace and quiet. I caught the first cab I could hail, stopped at a gas station for my first pack of cigarettes in three years, and then continued on to a hotel on the other side of town. Specifically, I went to one of those nice hotels with proper security where you can't even get into the elevators without a key. I stayed in that hotel for three days, not leaving my room, living off of room service, calling off work each day. I was at my wit's end and I was sure I had lost my mental faculties at that point, as nothing seemed to make sense. Eventually I checked out of the hotel midday and took a cab to my office. I was relieved to find no old man waiting outside the hotel, outside my office, or anywhere. Perhaps he had finally moved on. When I found my boss, he asked me where I had been, and I made something up about a stomach flu. I figured that if I was going crazy, I didn't need to advertise it just yet. He told me that they were running behind schedule because of my absence, and that I needed to jump back in. He started bitching at me about my work responsibilities, and I was pretty much tuning him out at that point, until he got to the last point he was trying to address. Stop leaving your frickin' garbage bags in the hall every night, too, will ya? He said. I told him that it was the custodian who did that every night, obviously, as I had no interest in staying late to clean the office. My boss gave me a weird look, and told me there was no custodian, no janitor, no cleaning staff, and that the bags were only ever found in the hall closest to where I work. It was obvious that it was my garbage, and he wanted me to just knock it off and move on. I restated my position about the custodian that I had nightly conversations with, and my boss's weird look instantly became more troubled. It took the police 23 minutes to arrive at the office. I told the police everything. The janitor, the old man, Georgie's, all of it. Within hours, the neighborhood was flooded with cops, and they eventually received the authorization and manpower to break down the door to Georgie's. As the cops who bore first-hand witness told the story to reporters, the smell of death was overpowering as the glass door shattered. The scene they walked into was both macabre and surreal. There were four bodies crudely stitched together from the parts of other bodies, as if somebody had taken four sets of heads, four sets of legs, four sets of arms and four torsos and mixed them all up into random configurations. The set, however, was missing pieces. One body had no arms, one body had no legs, one had no head, and finally, there was simply a pile of pieces with no torso to attach to. Macabre, surreal, 
unfortunately incomplete.